listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. At Rx Safe, we believe in improving patient health by challenging conventional wisdom, upending the status quo, and transforming the retail pharmacy industry. Our innovative technology solutions are designed to accelerate your pharmacy's success and change the way you do business. We develop long-term partnerships with pharmacies and other industry innovators to help attract new customers, create additional revenue streams, and transform the traditional pharmacy model. Become the adherence packaging leader in your community and practice at the top of your pharmacy license. Get started today. Visit rxsafe.com. That's rxsafe.com to learn more. Hey there, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm so excited to be presenting how specialty pharmacies are revolutionizing patient compliance. We look forward to these um, calls. We, we, We look forward to these podcasts and you are viewing us live on our webinar We welcome you. If you're listening uh, via podcast on one of your favorite platforms, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you want to pick up podcasts, we uh, very much appreciate your time. We know how important your time is. I have two um, special guests to me, um, both for different reasons. I was just saying to Matt Gilbert, he's become my uh, conference husband because every time I show up at a (laughs) pharmacy conference, I see Matt Gilbert with RxSafe. Matt, uh, it's great to see you. Like I say, I think I see you more than I see my wife now. Yeah, yeah, same here. You're you're my road husband, so uh, you're you're my ride or die. So uh, my wife's a little bit jealous, but uh, I'm sure we'll probably see you in two weeks or something like that, and we'll be right back on the road together. Glad to be here. Exactly at the next national conference. Conference season is between August and November. And I'm just like, uh, hey, um, uh, uh, my child, 11 years old, will grow three inches between now and then. I won't recognize him. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Brad Livingston, you and I have roots in, in them. If you've been around longer than five years, like we were saying, it, you don't want to ever burn bridges. You might light it on fire and smoke it a little bit, but don't ever <laughs> burn a bridge. And 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 I believe in that. So. Brad, you and I crossed paths back in the long-term care days and technology and uh, through different pharmacy management system platforms, but I am thrilled to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm going to kick off with the star of the show today, which is Brad Livingston, and I want to just uh, let our listeners know pharmacy runs through this guy's veins. Um, He's been expanding his pharmacy businesses from compounding to community pharmacy uh, specialty, mixed um, long-term care, and the services that you provide, Brad, have been um, pivotal and critical to your communities. Would you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, I'm a, a Washington State University grad, class of 96, go Cougs. And uh, shortly thereafter, I became a manager of uh, Long Strugs here in Olympia, Washington. And then, um, well, I left pharmacy for a little while to pursue a music career. And then I came back um, and started my own temping agency. So I I had the opportunity to work in 70 or 80 pharmacies in the state of Washington and had a a staff of pharmacists and techs. So I got a chance to see a a lot of things that were done well and a lot of things that weren't done well. And um, so I was at that time had some a family that was started young kids so i wanted to be closer to home so i transitioned from that to an ownership role with some partners and operated a retail pharmacy um what we called a specialty pharmacy at that time northwest specialty pharmacy and then we purchased a compounding only pharmacy so um, that was sort of my my baby for from 2009 to 2017 was compounding and nutrition and then when i left my partnership um, in 2017, I opened up this pharmacy in 2018 and been here since. Um, we're, a, we're a specialty pharmacy in name. We do a lot of things LTC. We have some specialty channels and we are uh, we actually are located on the Behavioral Health Resources campus here in Olympia. So we partner with our com- community really closely. And I also serve on um, some boards over, over the years and whatnot. So yeah, just been involved, involved as much as I can. Well, I appreciate you being here and the partnerships that you and I 
know how critical those partnerships are expanding what we do, my own career, and how much um, Arc Safe has participated in building content for community pharmacy owners. And then all of a sudden, they start really expanding into long-term care and now specialty pharmacy and how the, the lot of those lines are blurred between one sector to the next. Um, you know, the specialty pharmacy is expected to grow to a um, $861 billion market by 2028. <clears throat> Blows my mind uh, because I remember when uh, specialty pharmacy was really starting out and really growing um, out of the 90s from Statlanders out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is one of the original <clears throat> um, specialty pharmacies back in the day. You know, the sector is expected to grow by 8% per year through 2025 and drive um, that that constant focus and refinement of treatment and working and collaborating with physicians. Um, there are new limited distribution drugs and more personalized medications for those complex rare disease states that need ongoing management. And if you Google specialty pharmacy and you go to the news section, you'll see more data that is showing the pressure on networks and payers and physicians, and of course our pharmacists to deliver results for their patients. So once again, having partners um, to help us uh, grow our businesses and rely on them. I want to uh, just shout out to uh, Matt. You and I have talked offline many times about expanding a business. I really wanna start out with you just as a table set you know, what are the primary factors contributing to this anticipated 8% annual growth rate of the specialty pharmacy sector um, through 2025? Yeah, well, I mean, a few of the key drivers are, one, more, more drugs are being classified, you know, and we use classified loosely, but classified and paid for by th third parties and PBMs as specialty drugs. Um, you know, could view that as, well, the PBMs are driving that business back to themselves. Mm -hmm which is partially true, uh, but that that growth and the year-to-year -year pricing strategies that all these uh, drug manufacturers are using, that's contributing to these. So the more that enter the market, they've got a long runway before they go generic, the price keeps going up and up and up, and more people end up on them. You know, it's just a market that's been exploding more than any other, you know, over the last, say, 10 years. Brad, I want you to see it because Matt and I see it from a very similar perspective versus you. We're seeing it as how do we support you, Brad Livingston, and all of those specialty pharmacies out there to be as successful as possible. But you're in the trenches. So I kind mm -hmm. of like want to hear your viewpoint of this explosive growth of, over the next uh, 10 years. Yeah, I will, uh, frankly, I'm surprised it's only 8% because if I take what we sell that's classified by CMS anyway as a specialty drug, like the threshold's $830 for a 30-day supply of a particular ingredient is classified as a specialty pharmaceutical. I mean, those we sell a lot of those and and the pricing strategies are the primary driver, I think, for, for a number that low. Um, we used to see a 6% annual increase, and now we see a 4% biannual increase in most of those medications. So um, sir, I, I, I'm surprised. I think it's going to be higher than that, honestly, higher than 8%, because we're going to have a lot more products coming into the market uh, driven by data, driven by pharmacogenomics. Um, a, you know, the AI is just going to push that. Yeah, the, the estimate are right around 70 billion expansion just in generic specialty meds that wasn't here two years ago. And that expansion is going to put more pressure on uh, making sure that these therapies are managed correctly, which is why uh, my heroes are the, are the pharmacists out there doing it. Um, Brad, just to follow up, how do you envision the landscape of, pharm of the pharmacy industry evolving over the next decade, you just brought up something. You brought up pharmacogenomics, the role of the pharmacist meshing, you know this, compounding, long-term care, specialty pharmacy. So kind of give our listeners a little bit of, of your vision of the landscape of pharmacy industry evolving. Yeah, so um, a lot of, some of it's wishful thinking, but I think, you know, the, the, uh, with so much data out there and the ability now to aggregate that and analyze it, it's going to be easier to look at someone's individual profile as far as what their DNA says they will or will not handle um, 
and everybody's their own little chemistry set, right? So if you if you can kind of condense that for people and individualize therapy for them, then that's something that gets me excited. It's something that I think would be super beneficial for for obviously um, patients, but but professionally in terms of satisfaction, it would be great for that. The key is obviously, you know, how do we protect some of that so that it actually is um, it supports a business model as well. So yeah. There's a lot that goes into it, but I think that over over the next 10, 15 years, it's going to be um, an explosion of AI and people who, who are able to get individualized therapy based on their genomics. So we have 31 new specialty medications in the late stage development um, that are, are kind of at that uh, level of getting final approval by the FDA this year. Um, that means that those disease states and conditions need to have experts within them. When I see um, and hear about pharmacists really wanting to make a transition, maybe from uh, retail to specialty, and they have a knowledge on hep C or HIV or multiple sclerosis, I say to them, wow, like do more reading, um, possibly get a certified specialist <clears throat> specialist certificate in something, but there's huge expansion opportunities. And I think of um, what we constantly talk about, uh, pharmacogenomics brings this to mind, which is the personalization of medications. You know, as the industry shifts towards more of that personalized medication um, to complex and rare disease states, how do you think pharmacies can be per better prepared to adapt to this change? And I'm going to start with uh, Matt because of your perspective, and then we'll definitely get um, uh, Brad to answer the same question. Yeah, yeah. Well, from my perspective and RX Safe perspective, uh, we want to be able to produce, you know, pouches through our rapid pack. Uh, technology to keep patients adherent. And that's not exclusive to just their medications. That's targeted vitamins, nutraceuticals, uh, targeted uh, OTC therapies that may or may not be paid for by their PBM, but the pharmacy is recommending for nutrient depletion reasons. We want to take a holistic approach to it instead of saying, all right, well, we want to make sure you're adherent on your, on your strict RX items. That, that's not our game. That's so important because you think of the stop and start in therapy can become extremely disruptive. Even throwing that patient back into backsliding in their condition, they could end up in the hospital, whatever that, you know, there's multiple um, issues that could come of that. But Brad, what do you think of of the personalized medicine um, angle and, and the same question with, we know that these complex disease states may take more data and more time to adjust treatment as you move forward um, because of how complex they can be. Uh, how do we get our pharmacies better prepared and going up to the next level? We just talked before we started recording this webinar, this podcast, Brad made a comment about, you know, I don't want to attend a conference that has a specialty pharmacy 101 panel. I want to go to a panel that's like an advanced panel discussion, a 301 panel that really discusses advanced strategies. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I just, um, I echo a lot of Matt's thoughts on that. Um, the, the personalized medicine, I think, you know, uh, from my perspective, when I graduated from pharmacy school, it's it, you learn a lot about the commercially available drugs. What you don't really learn a lot about was just basic care of the human body. And really figuring out, um, I had a mentor, Randy Menser, who, um, who graciously sold me his compounding pharmacy, who is a clinical nutritionist. And I learned so much from him. He, is, uh, he was an amazing man. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he is, um, the difference that he was able to make in our small community, he, the guy had fans like I've never seen in pharmacy ever. And uh, and as I made me a true believer, and, and what he he made me see was um, was the bias, I guess, towards certain data that was paid for with big money. And rather than talking to people and finding out how they're doing and spending the time, you know, like you say, in the trenches, working with people and refining their therapies, I think that pharmacies could really benefit by getting their staff trained up on some of these integrative approaches that. When you're treating these complex disease states, 
um, looking at the root of some of the problems, like not treating just the symptoms, but you know, it's my belief and I'm sure the belief of a lot of people that inflammation is the root of all evil. So it's sort of like addressing those underlying conditions and, um, and, and naturopaths and physicians, there's a, there's a role for everybody in this. And then, it, and then you can really put a powerful and develop individualized package together for a person and you can watch them progress. And, and that's the exciting part about it for me. But you got to get people trained up. You got to you have to spend a little bit of money and get them trained and send them to the, the right places to get that training. Well, I appreciate, Brad, what you're saying about the role of the pharmacist, because I see um, specialists coming into play. Uh, even on our network, we have the pediatric pharmacist review, pharmacists focusing on rare diseases for our infants and how delicate that they are. And then I think of opioid use disorder, and you have an intimate background in in that um, uh, treatment and how comorbidity and polypharmacy for that individual patient that's suffering with an addiction and challenge, what other things are happening in that person's life to help the overall treatment of that individual, not just maybe their addiction, maybe there's something else going on. So I'm going to ask this of Brad first, but I also want, Matt, I want your viewpoints as well, which is for seeing the role of the pharmacist changing. I can see it changing in, in specialty pharmacy almost faster than in community, per se, because of those rare disease expertise um, tracks that are necessarily are necessary to share with our specialists and our physicians and our care teams and our payers and even the ecosystem of the patient, of their family, of of being that communicator. You're the advocate of their treatment. So, uh, Brad, talk to us about. Talk to us about the the specialty pharmacist specifically and what you there there's some of them listening right now. What do you say to them in order to kind of give them encouragement and, and inspiration to to continue to be educated about a specific disease state or condition? Yeah, well, I think for for me and for us as a pharmacy team, we really um we find the causes that our community cares about one of the big problems that we have locally is uh, homelessness and drug use and opioid use disorder. Um, we've got a big fentanyl problem now. And so we've, um, you know, I've developed relationships over the years with certain doctors in the, in the area who've, uh, who've been working on you know, der- various pathways towards treating this population of people. And it's, it's that kind of relationship for me that's kind of dictated which direction we were going right now. And as we grow, maybe we can add additional complex disease states, but you can't be everything to everyone and not, not when you're my size. <laughs> so I, um, you, you kind of have to pick your battles, I guess, and really know how to talk and communicate with the clients and the caregivers and provide them, connect them with other stakeholders in the community who provide resources, for example, um, someone who's in Al-Anon. Well, there's Al-Anon, but then there's also another part of Al-Anon that provides support to the people who care about those going through recovery and addiction. So, you know, there's, there are all these disparate resources that, um, that in our community anyway, are coming together. So we're, we're intimately involved at this point in making sure that we understand the needs of our community, community as it evolves because it just does. I mean, when we opened five years ago, there wasn't any fentanyl. And now treatment strategies have changed dramatically for that particular disorder based on the introduction of fentanyl. So I think of the word competition when you're talking, and I know that the hospital systems are, are expedited and very focused on specialty pharmacy. So when I think of Matt, the conversations that you have with customers in uh, different territories throughout the uh, throughout the country, who want to get deeper into specialty, and they'll look to you because of I mean, RX Safe is more than just a provider of the technology and the packaging. You guys have an entire team that helps people market their services, get things off the ground faster, and now of course specialty pharmacy. So what what's the um, when I think of that, like when I think of the role of the pharmacist. What's that essential knowledge or skills that you may talk to um, a community pharmacy about to really effectively navigate and tap into this specialty pharmacy boom? 
Yeah, well, especially uh, every just about every pharmacist I talk to tells me they're not a salesperson and they're not a marketing person. And my response is always, you are by default. Yeah. It's either you or it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, specifically what my team does at RxSafe in the business transformation department, uh, when somebody buys a piece of our technology, we actually we fly out there and uh, go on site with them for a couple of days and and hold their hand and bring them to drug detox centers prisons wow assisted living skilled home health agents i mean we've been i have been in the most podunk three bed facility in backwoods kentucky and i've been to you know 2000 bed sniffs 3000 bed 4000 bed uh, you know it's just crazy these campuses um but w- one thing that came to mind when when brad was talking about some of the opioid dependence um we took one of our partner pharmacies down in georgia and went to a drug detox center and it was really interesting getting inside the walls of there and getting the mentality of the facility it's a state run facility where they don't have a lot of resources they have low adherence rates they have technicians or you know nurses aides that are going in and administering medication and it, it wasn't a great practice and the average length of stay was only three and a half days it's so basically we we get them off of whatever they're on and send them on their way good luck but what our pharmacy did down there was, you know, go in and go with pouch packaging as the lead, but getting in there into a cash-based system. So there's no PBM involvement. There's no DIR fees. There's nothing going in and creating a cash payment system where not only you're getting the patient taken care of while they're in detox, but it's a long-term, hey, we're going to bring this patient into the family of the pharmacy and go through and make sure they're taken care of afterwards when they're on their own. So little things like that, that you know, independent pharmacy is the biggest chain that there is. There's 20,000 of us. And I I say us because I was a part of that community for 15 years running two stores in Connecticut. But that's all I deal with, you know, and we want to make all of you, you know, the the Brad Livingstons of the world successful. So we'll we'll do it any way we can. We want to make sure everybody's (laughs) successful. So Brad, how are you managing customization? Because like you you made comments about your size. And I don't necessarily think that that's a, um, a barrier to care for patients. I, I think it's just your reach into what networks you're part of and what access you have to different um, uh, payers and things like that. But in your community, you're extremely important because you're the go-to organization that people are coming to for answers. So talk about customized um, prescriptions and specialty pharmacy and enhancing that patient compliance and adherence, like that's the most important part is, is the pharmacist saying, I'm standing here between you and safety and it's and it's it's safety always on the mind of the pharmacist. And part of that safety is your adherence is to keep right. you going on this therapy. So how to customize, like how does, how does that customization, that custom care for specialty pharmacies enhance patient compliance and adherence? Yeah, I'll just use uh, an example of our behavioral health business. Uh, So we do a lot of long-acting antipsychotic injectables, and we'll administer them also for for physicians that don't want to do that on site. And so the big problem is always when these folks go inpatient and then they're discharged, they get lost before they show up for their first community appointment with with a provider. And so we help manage that. Part, so that they don't get lost, they don't, they're not forgotten about. And, and uh, the rapid pack is one way that we're able to send that out with the client, make it easy. So when they're discharged, make it as easy as possible for them to stay compliant with their medications. And whether they, you know, sometimes you have a provider who will give that long acting um, injectable before they're discharged, which is great, very helpful. Sometimes not, you know. And so we also want to be that resource for the for the providers to to give our professional opinion about where this client is and what would they would best benefit from. And so this is just a you know the rapid pack is a great tool that we have that makes us competitive um, in our market or any in any market, and it's scalable and it's very configurable. I mean, it, it really it's. Um, it helps us grow our business, but it really keeps us from losing business, more importantly. Well, I think when you talk about that too, Brad, you know, going into a, a hospital that doesn't have their own outpatient pharmacy and, and doing a similar program, whether it's meds to beds or something else, 
you know, going in and offering and saying, hey, we're going to we're going to manage that whole discharge medication process and we're going to reduce your admission rates. I mean, what better sell right. is there for a for an independent pharmacy going to a hospital than saying that? I, I can't think of one. Absolutely. Yeah. I, have, think of this, we, I think of the studies now that are being done, um, Brad, and just to follow up, I wanted to pour, pull more of that information out. You, you mentioned behavior health, but what other disease states are you seeing um, the ability and the opportunity to build um, customized programs to keep people adherent? Well, right now we're, we're focused on the behavioral health and the, and the um, opioid use disorders. And the, the thing about the two is it's, the, you know, the chicken or the egg. Yep. They have a mental health disorder that led to drug abuse or vice versa. And so those, those two for us um, are, what's, are what's driving us currently. We have, I mean, if I have my, <laughs> I, I'm celiac, so I have, a, I, have a, I have a spot in my heart for people who are celiac. I mean, I wish we could come up with a cure for that. That would be great. But managing that is another place where, where I feel like I can make a difference in, in people's lives. And, and there's not a ton of specialty meds out there for it, but you can help manage it with, with supplements and avoidance. Hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm thinking of, medication adherence issues that are are specific to specialty pharmacy um and i'm thinking of you might do a follow up and all of a sudden their payment um source changes and that that really could become uh very disruptive to treatment so what type of medication adherence issues are you facing in specialty pharmacy and and how are you addressing those yeah if they if they change and you know, we could be billing a, an injectable for them and then they change insurance and all of a sudden it's prior auth or it's got to be done out of a uh, out of another pharmacy somewhere um, we typically don't just take a no as a no we're we're a little thorn in the side most of the time or we if we don't get the answer that we're looking for and that can benefit the patient um, from the insurance company, we will involve the provider. And because of our relationships we have with the providers, they, they go to bat for us and for the clients because they know that this is in the best interest of, of someone who is dependent on this adherence of staying on track. And so um, we've been successful most of the time doing that, but it's just kind of like, don't, don't take no for an answer. And um, you're gonna get no's. But when you do that, when you, you don't just give up on your community, on your on your people that you take care of, you've got to advocate for them. You've got to advocate for yourself. Um, that's that's how you get it done. I think you, you know, you being an independent, somebody walks into the store and they've got an issue with their insurance is a heck of a lot easier to deal with than, you know, calling a, uh, a CVS, you know, mail order company and getting routed through the phone tree for a half an hour <laughs> and then getting disconnected right. and then getting a no at the end of that. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're, they just don't have the same par level that you do as far as service. And that goes across our fleet of, of all of our stores that are in the specialty space. Yeah. And people appreciate that extra touch, you know, and that's really that, that makes us more special than the name specialty pharmacy is the time we take to talk to people. And when we deliver medications, we're actually laying eyes on them and seeing how they are and relaying information to, to any of the providers that something seems off, then pass it along, you know? Some of the challenges that I'm thinking of when I'm listening to specialty pharmacists, I just got back from the National Association of Specialty Pharmacies annual event. And sure enough, we had a, a discussion in the NASP's booth about what are the challenges of treatment and they were they were talking about frequent dose adjustments the difference between uh, the data that's kicked back to the physician and the physician's oversight and sure enough they're making little different adjustments to the to the doses all of a sudden uh, once again a prior auth comes up because you just adjusted the dose and it's just yeah. like come on like it's it's slowing down once again uh, treatment or potentially more severe side effects when you're starting to titrate onto a medicine or a new medicine. You're not, and I remember the the nabs. I can't say them, Brad. The, the <laughs> something nabs and this a nabs and that's a nabs. But whatever, whatever this is, is it? It's like those those literally will change depending on the 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 
the timing of treatment in, in moving forward. And then specialty storage and handling and narrow therapeutic ranges and periodic laboratory testing. And it's just like, my goodness, like this segment of pharmacy, people think, oh, it's a specialty pharmacy drug because of the price. No, dude, yeah. that's like one of 12 other things that yeah. could be going on for it. So Brad, I wanted to hear kind of more on that of some of the challenges that you know that your your patients are experiencing and how you're, you're standing for them um, uh, in that process. Well, unfortunately, the biggest challenge for us is that we're roughly 70% Medicaid. And so um, it is hard when you're, <laughs> we have probably six or six or seven MCOs with their own PBMs that are Medicaid contracted in Washington. So um, not all of them pay well and on brand names in particular. So we're talking about specialty meds, predominantly brand name medications that you have a very thin, thin margin on. And um, the, the pain threshold is, um, <laughs> it's up there, you know, we're doing the right thing as a community benefit for our folks. And, and we just continue to hope that doing that will bring in other, um, other lines of business, I guess that, that will help offset that. But, um, I don't think I answered your question, Todd. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be did. honest with you. I think I just yeah. went off track there. I I like knowing from the ground level what people are thinking that are servicing these patients and what the challenges truly are. So, uh, you know, in and of itself, um, your answer was was correct. I I appreciate that. It really, it's, it's, it's just, anything it's just, that we're talking about. It's hard to ask a community pharmacy our size that does mostly Medicaid clients to to continue to dispense at a loss at a significant loss. And so ultimately, you know, we don't, we don't want our decisions about this kind of treatment or that kind of treatment to be directed by PBMs. And I guess yep. that is old fight. Right. And unfortunately, sometimes, um, sometimes that is a driver. Matt, I know because of how many pharmacists and pharmacy owners that you're talking to, that this limited distribution issue comes up. There's the the examples that I was talking to Brad about, about uh, patient training and compliancy management and clinical data reporting. What's coming up when you're out in the field, um, when you're talking with um, community pharmacies that have now expanded into specialty, what are the drivers of success that you're helping them to foresee so they can be better prepared for it. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing that that we find from the field, and I talk to probably 5,000 pharmacy owners in a year, you know, give or take, uh, maybe more. Um, you know, the biggest thing that they're dealing with from a specialty perspective is how do we effectively manage this treatment? How do we keep them adherent? And how do we monitor that? without costing me an arm and a leg and then, you know, getting a, a negative reimbursement on top of it sometimes. So the thing that RxSafe is really kind of delved head first into, you know, the last six months is uh, setting up a, an RTM program that is very, very dumbed down. You know, it's the most basic, you know, tracking mechanism that we can do out of one of our dispensing boxes. But what that does is it frees up the pharmacist from, calling every week or every other week. I know real time if my patient took that medication at 8 a.m. or noon or whatever time it was, and it logs back and it alerts me as the pharmacist saying, hey, this is somebody that missed their dose or missed two doses, and we want to check in on them to keep them adherent. Um, so that that's something that, you know, a lot of the technology that's out there is very sophisticated and it's got huge dispenser devices. It's cumbersome. It costs a lot of money, which is cost prohibitive for the pharmacy as well as the patient. And we went out and we've made some partnerships and some stuff that's going to be rolling out in the next few months with us. And it only uses our technology. So if you use our pouch packaging, you've got access to this whole new world and a whole new billing mechanism for certain disease states on top of that. So you can not only provide a better quality of care to a patient, you're actually going to get reimbursed a lot for it. So those are things that we're constantly hearing and taking feedback from prospects and customers and going to pharmacy conferences. And that's why we do 40 trade shows a year, because we learn so much from everybody we talk to. Every single conference I go to, we pull a new idea out of that. And, and that's why we do them. You know, it's not not just to sell equipment. We want to be a, a true partner with everybody and take their feedback and improve our products through that. 
Brad, I know that um, with with the compounding background and understanding maybe customized compounds, um, even a topical or something, versus a more complex um, regimen or treatment, which is our specialty pharmacy, what comes into play also is follow-up. And some of that follow-up is directly impacting adherence. So when we when we couple adherence packaging and follow up and communications, something that it might be missing that some of our listeners may not think about is the communications with the payer and communications with the provider, the uh, the physician. So how are you how are you assuring that um, physicians that are handing off their patients to a specific specialty pharmacy that has your specialty? kind of baked into it. How are you communicating to those um to those physicians that you're like, "Hey, I got this. Like we know what's going on and we have this technology and this packaging to assure adherence." Um how are you communicating that? Yeah, we basically just walk them through the process. I mean, um, if I'll use an example of the Sublicade network, we um has a very defined REMS process and and it's not the doctor's office there, you know, because now they don't have to have the special DEA number in order to be able to prescribe. They um, they basically just prescribe it and they want it delivered. And, and But there are all these guidelines that we have to follow as a pharmacy. So to help them understand from our perspective what it takes to make it go smoothly requires that, you know, we're talking with every single provider in that clinic about the requirements and making sure that we provide them not only with REMS guidelines, but maybe any sort of quirks about how we do it or when we're gonna be able to deliver those products out to their clinic, what our expectations are, what their expectations are, and then communicating you know, when it's actually administered so that we're making sure that we're following up in, that, in the timeframe in, in sublocate be 30 days around that time that we're uh, following up, but there's a subsequent appointment that, they, that they're that they scheduling for so that we can have the product in stock and just make sure that, that that process goes as smoothly as possible. But it's, you know, it's not something you can really do if you just think of yourself as being a traditional retail pharmacy or anything like that. You, you have to kind of bake all those services into your business model and allow, you know, figure out how you're gonna train your staff to to maintain that contact and streamline it. Non-adherence is so expensive and <laughs> it's so disruptive. Um, and I, I think of um, how it can create a comorbidity opportunity for something else to happen that you've stopped treatment or something took place and maybe the patient was too embarrassed to share it with their community pharmacist or even their especially pharmacist, physician, that I can't afford this anymore because something's changed in my life, which is where innovation of technology comes up and communications comes up. So I want to go to Matt and just because of how many pharmacies you're in touch with, um, you know, as you said, 5,000 a year, that's incredible. Um, that's more than me and I'm a podcaster that reaching 100,000 <laughs> listeners a year, um, uh, 100,000 listeners a month. So talk about innovation. What major shifts in innovation should we anticipate in specialty pharmacy um, over the next decade? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is going to be bringing adherence packaging to the masses. And that's not exclusive to pouch packaging. There's a, a lot of people out there where blister card is their preference, uh, different homes and facilities where they've had a nursing staff that's been on there. And, and these could be single or multi-dose, the Dispil medicine on times of the world. Um, but that's why we actually created a machine called the Rapid Card that is the same front end process as the Rapid Pack, same footprint, and the output just goes out in cards and it uses any type of card stock. We don't sell cards or anything like that. But specifically for this purpose, we knew, you know, there's going to be facilities out there, there's going to be patients out there where they want to stick with one modality. And that's been growing exponentially on both the pouch and the card, you know, for the last five or so years. Uh, and with more more and more people aging and staying in place at home, you're going to have more and more people taking specialty medicine at home and not dispense in a facility. Um, so we want to make sure that we have something that can accommodate you know, any type of uh, modality that they could need packaging in. So Brad, shifts in innovation, what have you seen? You might not have implemented some of this, but 
What have you seen in innovation that we can in this anticipate, and especially pharmacy, tied to um, promoting adherence and compliance? Um, well, I'm just I'm excited by what Matt's talking about, but I have seen the the card the card producing version of the of the rapid pack, and and that I think for me is likely to be the next step because you're exactly right. I mean, there are some big fans of strip packaging, and there are some who just don't like it, and. Um, and it's all about meeting the clients where they're at and sort of anticipating their needs, but also using technology to keep our expenses from getting out of control as things get more complex and harder to manage. So um, I'm excited to see where things are going. I, I don't have anything that's a, a favorite just yet, um, but I'll let you know if I find some. <laughs> no, we were, it's, been a, good, it's been, a, been a good partner. So When we were at a... Um at the NASP conference, we ran into a company called Pharmasol, um, and um, and they do personalized uh, texting that's attached to a database and library, and the AI knows what stage of treatment they are based on the NDC that's selected, and then it will send them personalized text that, that make the patient feel like it was a text from a human being saying something like, hey, um, how are you feeling today? And the patient's like, not so well. And the text or the AI might say, well, on a scale from you know one to 10, how nauseated are you feeling? Well, because it knows that nausea is a component of that segment of training or that leg of training. And what I think is going to help compliancy just from being out there and listening and, and watching and interviewing is personalization for each of the patients or what they're going through. And I'm thinking, well, how do we do that when Brad, you have hundreds, if not thousands of patients. Um, if I took every patient that was impacted by RX safe technology, it would be in the millions. I don't even know if you have a number for that, Matt, but it's, it, it's enormous. Right. And yep. I'm thinking, so how does communication, how can we utilize better ongoing communication to ensure that adherence is taking place without burdening the individual pharmacy that would have to make hundreds, if not thousands of calls. So Matt, that's kind of one for you and in, in what you're thinking from an innovation perspective. Yeah, well, from an innovation perspective, I get calls or emails or LinkedIn messages every week from different vendors and different people that want to do partners or just you know, a, a pharmacist that moonlights as an engineer and says, hey, I came up with this cool device, what do you think? And I got one of you kind of jostled my memory, but uh, earlier this week, I got a call from a guy and he said, I've got this dispenser that I've made. I don't have anybody using it right now, but here's the use case for it. And it was scan in one of the barcodes on our pouch. And then uh, right before that, it would alert either audibly or with a light on it for somebody who had hearing you know, issues going on. It's time to take your medication. You scan in the pouch and then it records and tracks that. But as a follow-up to that, he said, well, I've also got this other use case where I've got this summer camp for these children that, you know, they're, they're going through all sorts of treatments, cancer treatments. And I got a question from one of the parents and they said, hey, you know, would it be possible if we go forward with you and we find a partner pharmacy and we do the pouch packaging, could you write a note on every pouch that says, you know, hey, Kevin, hang in there, do this, you know, do that each day, you know, you're killing it. And I said, yeah, we can do that. We have free text fields. You could put blank pouches in there. We can write anything we want. And he was just blown away by that, you know, kind of partnering these technologies where, you know, is that is that a true medical necessity? No. But is that going to improve that patient's life? Hell yeah. So just, just really cool things that we get to talk every week about. Um, and, it, and there's so many great ideas out there from the technology sector. Customization, you know, yep. it's... It's the ability to customize that communication. I think of the box um, that um, uh, some RX safe customers will put their strip packaging into. And on that box is personalization opportunities and marketing opportunities and explanations of that treatment. And I also think of um, packaging and storage and the importance of temperature control and all of that much more easy to manage that than handing somebody a vial of tablets and expecting them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But expand upon that, Matt, because you see that, you see that every day. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the big benefits, we can fit a ton of uh, medication in one single pouch. So instead of doing two or three med passes or two or three tear offs, you're doing one. Um, it's just, it's making it as easy for the patient. You're taking a very dry, sterile topic of here's 20 vials, go take one of each or two of each or whatever it is. And you're putting it into a pouch with a customized font on it and the branding from the pharmacy on there and maybe a message on there for the patient is taking from that sterile environment of this is a task I have to do to reducing that by, you know, 20x probably time-wise and making it something that they actually enjoy doing. You know, this is a good question for you, Brad, because of the experience of very specific NDCs that you're managing, and that is the manufacturer's sensitivity around who who they're choosing or who is allowed to distribute a, a specific medication based on um, the need for REMS reporting or packaging or cold storage or the time that the, the patient gets onto therapy as quickly as possible. So talk to me about your perspective, because there are independent community pharmacy owners that are listening in that are like, well, how do we get deeper? Either how do we get into specialty pharmacy from the beginning, or how do we get deeper into specialty pharmacy with regards to the relationships around manufacturers? How are you managing that? Well, we've we've kind of found, I guess we could say almost a back, back door into the, the specialty channels by making ourselves a a uh, strong and almost indispensable community partner with, um, particularly with the Beeb Clinic here in Olympia. You know, we, we're we at 800 or 1,000 clients who are struggling with opioid use disorder. And and so it really, um, the providers who are using us through the clinic, we're also using specialty pharmacies to um, nation national specialty pharmacies to get product, but it just wasn't working. For various reasons, so um, you know, out of I think out of necessity to reach this this client base where they're at, it was kind of you when know, they started discussion through MHA our buying group about becoming part of the network, and so we've been doing it now. I would say about six or seven months, and it's really starting to gain some some traction there and seeing some positive results as, from that. So, I mean, it's exciting, it really is. So Matt, um, you get this question, I'm sure, weekly, which is a community pharmacy who's doing pretty well in their community. They have a reputation. They may have even great reputations with manufacturers and payers, but they say to you, Matt, um, from your experience, how do I get deeper into specialty? How do I expand um, my specialty business? What, what answers do you have uh, for some of those? And by the way, adherence and compliancy is part of that blueprint. Yeah, well, I think piggybacking off what Brad said earlier, you know, he's he's a smaller fish in the pond, but that doesn't mean he's not a fish in the pond. Right. Uh, you know, networking locally is is the single biggest thing, regardless of what denomination of pharmacy it is that you can do, and and building out those prescriber networks and and saying here we're going to offer you a higher level of service for your patients. We're going to make it as painless as possible. Here's our here's my direct cell phone number. I tell that to a lot of our pharmacists that have our rapid pack and rapid card machines, go to a prescriber and tell them, here's my personal cell phone number. If you need something, call me and see what kind of impact that makes. You know, and it, it, it goes, you know, through the roof. Every, you know, big box store that's in town, well, they would never do that. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that the pharmacist can do is believe in themselves as a, as a partner versus a vendor. You don't want to be the the dispenser, the guy that everybody envisions, you know, the, the pharmacist sitting on the bench counting by fives. That is not <laughs> the case at all. You know, the pharmacist is doing everything they can to to keep the pharmacy afloat and coming up with all these new ideas and branching out into different networks and getting special contracts for these different drugs. So there, there's a lot of different levers they can pull. But I think the biggest one is believing in themselves as a partner and going out and partnering with the different physician networks. Yeah, don't allow yourself to be so siloed that you're just pharmacy. I mean, if you're having a, a an issue with with the laws, even the laws of your state, guess what? You can partner with some physicians and you can you can find some people to actually get laws made or changed if it makes sense for for patient safety, adherence, outcomes. I mean, 
when you're talking about uh, that sort of thing, you have lawmakers that just, they just don't know what they don't know. Many are well informed, but many aren't. If there's something that needs to be changed, you, you got to let somebody know <laughs> and do something about it. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm thinking we talk about the growth. We're talking about uh, compliancy and how technology and our packaging can be a part of that. However, more importantly is the ongoing communication with our patient to make sure that they are staying compliant if they have any questions or concerns, which give us an opportunity to really unpack what's the true issue that the patient is experiencing. And I think you can be a mail order giant and I'll bet you mail order, Matt, we have to look this stat up, but I'll bet you mail order has more non-compliance, these massive mail order companies than our smaller pharmacies like Brad, who has the true relationship with his his patients and the patient's family and the support unit and the physician that knows what's going on because those physicians trust Brad because they know, hey, this guy understands opioid use disorder. Or he understands this specific addiction. He's packaging things correctly. He's educating the patient correctly. This whole ecosystem is so important. Sometimes that ecosystem is disrupted by those profit elements of our big, big, huge conglomerate PBM driven pharmacies that are really not looking at the individual. Everyone on this call right now, everyone on this webinar right now is focused on the individual and the patient need and the patient compliancy and the patient follow up. So, Matt, let's discuss moving forward. And that is, we want personalized medication. We want compliancy. We want the right technology. What steps do we take? How can specialty pharmacies ensure a patient centered approach while still maintaining because we still have to be profitable and we definitely still have to be scalable? Yeah. Well, from, from an RX safe perspective, uh, we get pretty creative. So, you know, whether it's no money down or no payments for six months, uh, we get pretty creative with the financing. And we also customize each of our solutions to that pharmacy. Um, so we have the ability to scale up the rapid pack and rapid card from a 20 cartridge to a 30 to a 40. Some people buy multiple units. Some people want an enterprise server where they're dispensing or sending orders from three, four, five, six, ten 10 different stores, and we could accommodate that. So the, the nuance to each store is totally different. No two pharmacies are the same. No two pharmacy owners are the same. So whether it's customizing the machine, the software, the backend marketing support that they need, customized boxes, we really want to take a holistic approach and, and find what fits for that particular pharmacy and helps them take it to that next level, whether that next level is just getting into specialty or just getting into LTC or just getting into combo shop or just opening a retail pharmacy. We've got people that, you know, they worked on the bench for a chain store for 20 years and said, I'm burnt, man, I'm going to open a store, but I, I love your machine. I want to get it in there. How can we do that? And we help them do that. So um, we're, we're, we're here to help. That's awesome. I appreciate that. That comes through your entire staff too. It's, it's, um, it, I've talked to several people on the RX safe staff that always reaches out and finds the answer. If they don't have the answer, they're going to, and by the way, some of the best answers that have come from RX safe have actually come from the Brad Livingston's of the world, which is their customer base and the information base. And that's why I want to come back to you, Brad, and just get your, um, your viewpoint on profitability and scalability as a pharmacy owner. Like I, that's a challenge. And and sometimes you lose a couple of patients, maybe because of a contract change um, and you have to make that up. But what's your strategy around um, keeping patients compliant? That's that's key. That's the safety that I'm talking about, keeping them on the treatment. But let's talk about profitability and scalability from your perspective. Yeah, well, obviously, profitability is always a, a huge factor for us. Um, I mean, I would say if, if you're going into the specialty world where you're doing a lot of a lot of brand name stuff, you've got to have a certain pain tolerance for low margins. And, um, you know, but also keep in mind that, you know, it's a percentage game. And if, if you're selling a, a, a larger dollar amount, you can sometimes get away with a smaller percentage. Um, and you not overload yourself with work. I think and I appreciate RX Safe and in, in that they they're always listening to people like me. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I always feel like 
they want to know what could help us and that they're actually working to solve our problems as community pharmacists and not just looking to sell um, force feed an industry what they come up with. So I appreciate that. So I'm always looking to see what they have as the next great thing coming out um, and making sure it, it fits with what we're doing here. Um, there are so many advantages to having a small footprint, super configurable, scalable, don't have to increase my inventory. All the advantages that, that small businesses really have to pay attention to. Because um, I think, you know, many who are <laughs> been doing what we've been doing for a long time, no, it's a it's a shell game, you know, like next year, where's the money? Is it under this shell? Is it under that shell? Is it going to come from rebates? Is it going to come from um, a different payer mix? What's, what's it going to look like? So uh, those are those are challenges that you just have to rise up and meet every every year. But you've got to just have a thick skin and, and know that um, doing the right thing for your patients ultimately will pay off. And if you look at this in the future as I'm gonna help you, the individual, there's an opportunity there for you to feel good about making some money charging cash for a product or a service that's not offered by someone else that's gonna improve their health, their outcomes, you know, just, just make life more enjoyable, not only for them, but for you as a pharmacist, because I mean, you get stuck in a pharmacy just counting pills, That's not for me, not for me anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yep. And that's an element of pharmacy that um, we have to be honest with each other as an industry. We have, you know, chain community pharmacy that um, is going through a tremendous amount of burnout. And there are some, um, well, the majority of them, uh, just uh, beautiful people that want to help other people. They're intelligent. They want to be more clinically driven. And that kind of ties back to the whole theme today, and that is understanding the compliancy barriers. And one of those barriers is making it so simple for patients to stay on their medications and not make it a complex thing where you're worried about how many vials of medication that you're on, as well as what Matt has taught me, which is putting in supplements inside these packs that we know there might be a deficiency in something happening in this person's life and, you know, put in a vitamin B12 complex or putting in a, um, you know, a nitric oxide or something that can, and I make up the worst examples, guys. I'm not a but I'm with you. you, you <laughs> add something in there. <laughs> Yeah, and communicating that to the prescriber, you know, whether it's patient driven or whether you you want to talk to the prescriber directly about some of the things that they don't they don't know they could be prescribing even. I mean, the advantage here in, in our state, anyways, if 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 they go ahead and write a prescription for a supplement, then at least you save them the tax on that. You know, it's an, it's an advantageous for everybody, and then we can keep track of it. The physician can keep track of it, and the patients get in the benefit. It's it's a win win for everybody. When we started this webinar and discussion, uh, the very first thing that I had mentioned is the conference season. And guess what? We're still in it. So if you're a listener and you are headed out to Orlando, Kissimmee more specifically, and you're going to the National Community Pharmacists Association, I want you to schedule your meeting with Matt now because he only has so many minutes and so many hours at that event. So if you're interested in expanding your business, if you're interested in getting into specialty pharmacy and you have to understand the technology side of this, if you're interested in replacing a machine that is taking up way too much space in your pharmacy and you know that you need to be small, you need to be nimble, and you need to be connected to a team that gets it and can take you from point B to point Z without having to do it all on your own, reach out to Matt. Matt, I know that the team is going to NCPA. Um, what's the best way that a listener can reach out and, and, and set some time up with you while they're out there? Yeah, uh, reach me at uh, my email address, mgilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T at rxsafe.com. My cell number, 860-465-7349. Uh, in addition to being at NCPA, we're going to be releasing a couple new products there. Oh, so if wow. that uh, if that piques you your interest, you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah this first. is a this is a live uh, live uh, tease. I'll say that. Uh, but we'll be at NCPA. I've got a huge booth right at the front door. Can't miss us. Call me ahead of time because we get super busy. Uh, but if you're not going to NCPA, we'll be at ASCP, ASHP, uh, and then if you're on the specialty side, we'll be at Assembia coming up, which I think is March, April time range in Vegas. Right. 
Um, so yeah. we'll we'll be at another 40 or 50 of them again this year. <laughs> what about you, Brad? What next um, event are you going to be attending? I'm going to be tied down here probably for for a while. Probably it's, I'll yeah. be my next one will be probably the MHA meeting um, down in Florida. I think at least in March. Very so, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. especially getting to the end of the year too. Um, I'll I'll leave everybody with one final thought. It's uh, tax season coming up, so Section 179, which uh, gives you an advanced depreciation on yeah. any capital equipment purchases. Uh, I know Brad's used that, so he saves a ton of money, put it back in his pocket instead of paying the IRS, which is always a good thing. Uh, but you've got to get that equipment installed in the year that you claim it. So right now we're we're bumping up to booking out towards the end of the year as far as installs go, uh, but we can still accommodate a few more. So if anybody's had a good year, you know, and wants to explore our technology, uh, use Section 179, put some more cash in your pocket. That's awesome. Absolutely. RxSafe.com. Uh, uh, we appreciate RxSafe and your partnership with the Pharmacy Podcast Network. And I like these discussions because they're educational. There's things that we can execute on. Brad, this can't be um, the the last time that you and I talk on the podcast. <laughs> you have so much information you could probably uh, be a resource I, of. So I want to thank you, Brad, for being our special guest today. Absolutely. Thank you. It's great being here. A shout out to our viewers of this webinar and listeners of our podcast. You pharmacists and pharmacy owners are our heroes. If there's anything that we can ever do for you, please reach out to Pharmacy Podcast at pharmacypodcast.com. You can find us on all the social media platforms at pharmacypodcast.com. And we have the red phone to Matt. So if you can't find Matt, just call <laughs> us and we'll get you in touch with Matt immediately. Definitely. Sounds good. Thank you all for participating today and being part of this. Uh, and like I said, it's Together RX that we're in this uh, and, and anything that we can do to help you, please let us know. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Bo. Bye now. Yeah.